Is that the right way to say it? Screen? And uh, it's really good. Hey, I don't, I don't want to take up any time. It's, it's an absolute privilege to have, uh, I was going to say Pastor Dave York. I don't know, do people still call you Pastor? Just Dave. Have Dave here with us. And um, I think you're really going to enjoy him, and um, hopefully he's going to mess us up a little bit. So I'm going to hand it over to him and let him say a little bit more, and let's, let's go. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. Hey, hey, hey. How are we? Revive. We good? Um, great. So I'm Dave. Hi. And uh, my wife, Jen, uh, she's disappeared. She's heard me a thousand times. She's sick to death of me. So she thought you would go back to the hotel and uh, prepare for tonight. She, she, she just wants to be just right for tonight because she's ministering tonight. And uh, so she's left me on my lonesome in this meeting to preach to you guys. I, I want to firstly say to Craig and to Trinity, thanks for the invite. Uh, we love New Zealand. There's something about New Zealand that is, that is extraordinary. And also it's the beginning of great moves of the Spirit of God across the world. Uh, I remember the back in the days of Dave and Dale Garrett, those days, you know, with whatever it was called, worship and song or something like that. Songs of praise, I don't know. But, uh, but you know, the good old days. And then I remember Crowded House, the rock band, uh, changed my life when I was at university. Uh, Neil Finn and, and uh, Timothy Finn. And, uh, and then the Pringles uh, came over to Australia. The Houstons came over to Australia. And uh, what is it about New Zealand? Gosh. It's the birthplace of some great things in God. And uh, let, me, let me say that it's fabulous. This room's a brilliant room, isn't it? Who's jealous of the LCD of the whatever it's called behind me? You're jealous of that? And the graphics on that, gosh, whoever does those graphics, the guys at the back there, um, great job, outstanding job. And uh, we came at the, uh, we arrived at uh, Auckland Airport last night, and of all people, uh, met Bruce and Michelle. At the airport, they were so hungry to meet us that they decided to drive into. They found out what plane we were on, and uh, and stalked us, and uh, got an autograph and that, and uh, and uh, and then uh, this morning, the first person I met was Nate. Where's Nate? Are you in the room, Nate? Hi, Nate. Uh, the funny thing about Nate is that is that I know John Cameron a bit, right? When I met Nate, I thought he was his younger brother. And so I had to make sure the surnames were different and that. And they both come from, both in Wellington as well. And, uh, but Nate, what a joy to meet you and, and uh, to see that you're on the team. Uh, Bruce, I've kind of met two, three, team, four team members already. There's only one person I haven't met yet. So, um, so I'm, I'm pleased to be here, you know. Um, I've been in, uh, in uh, if my words are slurred uh, from time to time, I've been in Texas for um, about three weeks or so and preaching non-stop in Texas. And, and uh, it, it was an effort though. I went, to a, I went to a shop, I said, I'll have some, uh, some what was it, uh, broccoli and um, what kind of cheese goes with broccoli? Soup, right? And I said, I'll have some butter with that. And uh, she said, oh, she said, what? I said, butter. And she said, what? I said, butter. I, and she said, no, we haven't got any. All we've got is got some mayonnaise and some butter. I'm thinking, what a ridiculous conversation this is, that they don't understand Australian in Texas. And so it, it and it preached the Brazilian church where I was being interpreted uh, into Brazilian. And that took everything out of me, you know, because I use a lot of colloquialisms, a lot of Australianisms. And so that took a lot of energy out from me. And uh, so here I am. We were in the United Kingdom for 29 years and we came back uh, to Australia uh, at the beginning of COVID. COVID was a disturbing uh, time for us. And it was a challenging time for us. And sometimes you reach the perfect storm, and sometimes the perfect storm uh, is, is designed to perfectly migrate you in the very center of God's fresh will for your life. You know, sometimes we, we think that, that some things are totally destructive. And if they are totally destructive, a grain of wheat has to die at some stage. And if it doesn't die, it remains a single seed. But if it does die through the perfect storm, then it, then it creates the perfect harvest. And I think some of us have been through a lot of stuff that seemingly is destructive, but in the economy of God is constructive. You know, God takes away the first in order to establish the second. And sometimes God's taken away some stuff in our lives, but he's only doing it to make room for. And he's, he's making room for the best that's yet to come in each one of our lives. None of us have peaked yet. You know, you, you're not a one-hit wonder like the Baha men who let the dogs out. You know, you're, you're, you're like Elton John, not in every way, but, you, but you're a hit maker. 
and, and your greatest hits, your, your Bohemian Rhapsody is yet to be written, your Hotel California is yet to be written, your Layla, Eric Clapton's about to be written, and, you know, and so sometimes we think we've peaked it in the past, but it's absolutely not true. You know, if, if, if God's been testing you, if God's been trying you, it's only to make prove that your faith's genuine. And when he finds genuine faith, then, then God can, can unlock the treasuries of heaven and bring out stuff that no eye has seen, no ear has heard. And I've got a feeling that, that everything you've been through uh, in the last number of years is a stitch up from heaven. <laughs> a bit of convincing there, right? But it, because all things, not just some things, but all things, every single dot, every single tick, every single thing works together for good to those who love God, who are called according to His purposes. There's, there's nothing, there's no, hydro, there's no potent hydrogen in your life that, that God won't mix with the beautiful oxygen of faith and create the springs of living water of your future. And all we're doing is we're applying faith to something that was incredibly potent, incredibly destructive. But when you add faith to it, everything changes. You get rivers of living water from hydrogen mixed with oxygen. I just, I just, think, I just think sometimes you can think, well, well you know, optimism is because I've just come from America. I've just come from the kingdom of God. And if you cut faith with a knife, it bleeds in anticipation something good's about to happen. Let's keep on going until you're noisier, right? <laughs> the, the, you know, that the, the, you can't tell faith by the state of your marriage. You can't tell faith by the state of your finances. You can't tell faith by the size of your church. You can't tell faith by the condition of your health. Because faith is lassoed to an unseen tomorrow. The only reason why you've got faith is because um, it's last sued to the promises of God that are yet to be realized within your life. You're pulling the future into the present by your faith. And so you can't tell. You know, you, you, being a man of faith and of power means nothing to us. It means nothing to faith because faith has nothing to do with what you see. It's got everything to do with what you believe, but not what you see. But... The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1, it says that, that faith is a substance or the foundation of things hoped for. And so it seems to me there's a correlation between belief and hope. There's a correlation between trust and an expectation something good's about to happen. You put faith in a prison cell, the condensation of hope always drips down the algae windows just before the dawn. I'm a thespian as well. If you, put, if you put faith in a field, then the dew of hope will gather around the seed of faith at the darkest point before the dawn. That's how it works. If you put faith in the washing machine, the red dye of hope dyes everything. It stains everything in it. I'll just say this. Never exalt a miserable Christian. <laughs> because, because either they haven't got faith or they're disobedient to the faith they've got. Because faith, you know, the Bible says that the, that the righteous will fall seven times, but rise again. And some of us have, have, have fallen the perfect number of falls, but, you know, you fall seven times, you rise up eight. Success is getting up one more time. Then I just think that, that what you've got to allow there to be an expectation within you that something good is about to happen because faith breeds. Faith breeds an anticipation, an expectation of something unseen that's about to take place. That, that's why a buzzing church is not necessarily a growing church. A buzzing church is where people uh, allow faith to bubble up within them. And to bubble up is the word prophecy in the Old Testament. And I think you, if you can allow yourself, even in these meetings, allow yourself to get a little bit more excited about the future instead of thinking it's just going to be a plain hard work. It's not true. There are breakthroughs coming for each one of you. And if you're in the right frame of mind, attitude determines altitude. I'll preach on that, right? And that's not just Americanism. That's the Bible, that God's the greatest optimist. And the reason why you're alive today is because there's unfulfilled prophecies over your life. God's about to do great things amongst us. So what I'm going to share about is I'm going to share, share uh, five reasons why everything that's gone wrong in your church is not your fault. <laughs> I just thought I'd start with that, right? Because as Christians, I don't know about you, but I'm susceptible. I'm, I'm a diligent guy. I want to change, right? 
And, and we often think, well, if someone's criticizing you, then there's got to be some truth in it somewhere. And so we're forever going through the carcass of other people's criticism. And because we're sincere, we're trying to find that little, that little diamond of, of, that we can learn from, that we can teach from. And I've got a feeling there's, there's other paddocks where diamonds are better found. But it's our sincerity that, that we so want to be like Christ that, that, we're, that, we'll, that, that we'll often find ourselves in the mortuary of things that have died, trying to find that, that grain of truth that we can plant for tomorrow's harvest. But I think it's because we're overly sincere. I think it's because we're not just humble, we're overly humble people. We, we, as leaders, we, we are susceptible to, to all kinds of condemnation and all kinds of guilt. And I want to predict in this room that a lot of us have been crushed by carrying weights that we should never have carried. I've never had someone leave the church saying, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm hooked on Pornhub and I'm, and, and I'm going to backslide for six months and I'm going to come back into the church. I've hardly ever had anybody leave the church saying they've got a private secret sin. Just when every person leaves the church because they hate me. You know, they've, they've spent hours, spent years sharpening the knife of criticism. And it's all, it's all upon me. That partly is because, because if, you, if you're leading a church, then you, re, then you reflect. You're going to got a lot of punches that, that are punches for Jesus. You know, plus, plus God does use your idiosyncrasies to annoy people. It's because iron sharpens iron, you know. So never, you should never go to your staff saying, hey, if, if, some, if you've got a real problem, uh, come, and, come and see me and I'll help solve the problems. Because you are their problem, right? And it's, and it's, it's not deliberate. It's, it's, it's just because of the way you're wired. It's like whenever you're in a small group, there's always somebody there who you really vastly dislike. You know, they, they, obvi- they always turn up because the greatest discipleship is that sand in the oyster. And so God makes sure there's a sand in the oyster in every oyster. You know, there's, there's a piece of sand there because God's trying to create pearls, pearls of great price. Um, you know, but, but in saying all of that, 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 that we, we so, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm very sincere. And I really want to grow in Christ. And I listen to the critics too much. I don't know what kind of personality you've got, but I've got an overly sensitive personality. And people say, oh, Dave, harden up. I've tried. I just can't do it. And I realize it's because I've got a melancholic personality. It's because I'm a strategizer, because I'm a thinker, because I'm a dweller, because I'm a step maker. I'm not just a, a vision caster. I'm, I'm a vision clarifier. I'm a step maker. This, so it just makes me hypersensitive. Plus my love language, it's words of affirmation. And so it's just, why did God call me to the ministry? She, thank you very much. But it's, but it's the cruelest it's the cruelest business because you get smacked for a few things you did wrong. You get smacked because you're heading up the church. You get smacked because Jesus Christ lives within you. You get smacked all the time. And it's a difficult job, this. You know, when they, when they criticize you, oh, gosh, I can't, I can't teach. Uh, you don't love people. Except, but what, when I do really well, uh, you did good. That's the best Christians can come up with. And I'm a man who loves love language, right? I'm thinking, what was good? Describe us. What, what was good about, about what I did? Tell me something. Give me something. But Christians are notoriously lazy when it comes to praise. We live in a desert territory where demons are lurking around every corner to rip us to bits. And the best the church can come up with, oh, you did well. Yes, yes, but it doesn't offset the fact that I feel absolutely miserable because I'm being attacked on every side. I'll tell you, I'll just say this about reserve sides, that, that, that God makes sure that, that I don't get thoroughly praised by humanity because I get hooked on it. I'm like a heroin addict. If, if, you, if you praise me on Instagram, I'll screenshot it put it into my notes, you know, just, just you know what I mean, I'm just, I'm just hooked on it. And I realized that, that, that the best of what I've done historically has never been praised and has never been seen. It's reserved. Because there's some stuff that each one of us has done this, in this room that, that God wants to congratulate you personally. 
He doesn't want it to be through his community or through his saints. He wants to do it directly. And so the very, you know, the good news is the very worst of what you've done isn't seen by anybody either. And we've done some pretty bad things, haven't we, church? Come on, <laughs> come on, stop lying. That's, that's a bad thing, that lying, even in church, <laughs> in the conference, in the revived conference. Right? But, you know, but often God, God's grace, when people criticize us, uh, even legitimately, it's, it's not the worst thing we've done. Gosh, if only they knew the worst thing that we've done, how they could have a field day. What they've seen is the second worst thing, right? Thank God, you know. But it's the same, the opposite, that, that everyone, if they do thank me, they thank me for the second best thing that I've done. But, I'm, but my heart's still weeping because, because of, of the things that I've done that have required the greatest sacrifices. That surrounding them is absolute silence. And I've got to realize it's just silent just for a few more years, Dave. Until you come into the great throne room, to, to the great arena of heaven, that's when it's going to get noisy. And so some of us, in one respect, we're in a weakened state here. You, we encourage ourselves in God, but we're still in a weak, we're still in a vulnerable state. Because none of you get the praise you deserve. Not one of you in this room gets the praise you deserve. You do things under God, and there's silence in return. Now, God will not be forever silent. But there's silence from the church, and so we feel like we've got a strange relationship with the church. Because we're given out all of the time, but there's not enough markers to mark whether we're doing really good or whether we're not doing really good. You know, I'll tell you just a few other reserve uh, signs that that are on your life. It's it's even in your children's life. There's there's a place in the life of your children that's complicated. That when you get close to it as a parent, there's there's a there's a wire fence around it, and God and there's a note saying go no further. Because God's going to have the opportunity in every child's life to become their savior. And the problem with parents is, is their fingers are everywhere. You know, the, 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 you're often wanting to pamper your kids. You're wanting to, you know, and, and every one of them have got an eternal problem, a, 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 an oil slick, a blood flow that, that, you, that you can only watch from a distance, wishing if only I was there, then I could, I could plug it up. And you've got to realize that, that the only way people, beca Jesus becomes somebody's savior is, is to allow humanity to come no further. So it becomes a holy place for them and for God. And so there's some, there's some areas that you're pastoring that, that you wish that you could solve, but they're unsolvable. And so I just, I, the reason I say that is because we're in a, we're in a, a I'm not a weakened state, it's the wrong word, but we're in a susceptible state here. Because the things that you want to plug, you can't plug. And then the things you do your best, there's, there's silence. And, and then it seems to me in ministry that, that, that people's rejection is God's ejection into your God-given future. That, that, you know, when, when you should get the promotion, but you don't get the promotion. When you get overlooked, and every one of us have, have been overlooked in the last couple of years. And it's a tough thing when you get overlooked because you had all the candidacy, you had all the attributes needed, but you get overlooked. It's because you've been reserved. It's because there's a reserve sign for some future ministry appointment that, that, that nobody knows about, not even you know about, but there's a reserve sign on you. And that's quite difficult when they're choosing uh, seven men known to be full of the Holy... Or is it six men known to be full of the Holy Spirit uh, in Acts chapter 6 or seven men? And there's Barnabas. I mean, he should have been picked first. He wasn't even picked amongst the seven. You know, but he's, he kept on writing songs without a recording contract. He, he made a 250-kilometer trip to Tarsus to find Paul, 250-kilometer trip back. He, he, was still, he was still an encourager, but he had a reserve sign on him. And every one of us in this room have got a reserve sign on, that you, you'd have deserved better things in the last couple of years. And I'm not going to give credit to the enemy. I'm, I'm going to give credit to God. It's because there's been an invisible reserve sign on you because the best is yet to come. If Joseph had been released from jail when he was... Uh, uh, when he was working in Potiphar's household, the best that he could have been is a chain gang leader in Siberia. 
but because the timing was right, because he stayed with it, because there was a reserve sign, he ended up in the, in the prison underneath the palace, 50 foot away from destiny. Then he interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker while his own dreams lay unfulfilled, and then he interpreted the, the dream of Pharaoh. Then he became second highest in the land. So, because he was reserved for second highest in the land. He wasn't reserved to be a chain gang leader. And I just think, but I just, the reason I'm saying all of that and giving you an understanding of God is because it's all a little bit confusing. It's all a bit cryptic, you know? And, and so when somebody, when, when, when your church, when people leave your church, the first thing you think of, what have I done wrong? And that's what success culture does too, because it builds everything around this, this leader with nine spiritual gifts wrapped up in one exciting package. And so, you know, and so when people, when people come, you think, whoa, look what I've done. Can I suggest you didn't do it? <laughs> Can I just bring you down to earth here? There's no such thing as a great man of God, only a man of a great God. But let, let's get this right. God anoints ordinary things for extraordinary purposes. And so don't sort of, you know, suddenly launch your Instagram page, you know, full of pictures of you preaching because the church is growing. You know, you're a custodian of an unusual set of divine circumstances. You're not the owner of it. And you don't own the church. You're a custodian of it. It's the same if you had a disabled child. You don't own the child. You're a custodian of it. You're a steward of the child. And I pick disabled because it's, it's difficult from time to time. But they're not you. You're a custodian of them. And it's the same with the church. Whether it's, whether it's enabled or disabled, the church isn't you. You're a custodian of it. They're a library book. And so don't just run it as if, there, oh gosh, five more people are leaving today. And each one of them, not one of them, um, says that they're into pornography. The major vice of the male population. They all have a legitimate fake excuse for leaving your church and and I allow them to fake it out because I want them to leave with a measure of dignity I don't want to strip them down you saying you pack of liars you hound of foxes you know I don't want to strip them down I want them to go in dignity but but the dignity is a false dignity because there's something about their, about the growth of, of that God wanted them to take the step of growth that they decided not to grow. Now, not in every occasion, but you know what I mean. Like a lot of people say, I just not, I just don't like this place anymore. I used to like it, but everything's changed in this place. I don't like it anymore. And so when they grow, they then criticize the leader. And I've got five reasons why you've got nothing to do with it. And the reason I'm sharing this is because you're carrying burdens you ought not share. You should be as fresh as a daisy. You should be as fresh as the day you were born again. But you're carrying stuff. You're carrying guilt, condemnation, inadequacy, a lack of confidence, a feeling like you are a pretty bad sinner, a feeling like you're a, a rat with a capital C leader, feeling you know you're feeling like gosh i'm a 4.2 leader yet if you're the right person in the right place at the right time you're a 10 10.0 leader you're a 10 out of 10 leader oh gee this, there are forces against you the key the key the key the next you is the next big thing revival's not coming to the hills of, of your town, your city, without going through you. And to go through you, God's getting ready to go through you. He's making you large. He's making you durable. He's, 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 he's working. God's expanding you on the inside. And it's, it's, it's under the surface. It's private. And hardly anybody knows about the transformation that's going on in the inside of you. But the next you, that's the next big thing. That's why you're under attack. I'll just go technical now. The next you is the natural you unearthed. Some of you were more you at eight years of age than 38 years of age because of disappointment, fear, and doubt. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the original you unearthed 
mixed with the anointed you. And the anointed you is God's towers of strength on your fault lines of weakness. That's quite an operation. Because, because if you think, well, I'm a loser in this area of my life, that's God's construction zone. That's where God puts his greatest strength. You think, well, I got rejected by dad. Well, here's a, here's a tower to fatherhood. You know, he, he, I, I got ruined by, by, you know, people abused me. Well, here's a tower to, to reconciliation or a tower to, to, to restoration. It's just the way God works. I don't do a lot of marriage seminars because I've had a pretty good marriage. I don't do healing, healing crusades because I've never really been that sick. But those who have been sick, they're the ones doing the healing crusades. Those that have had a rocky marriage, they're the ones who do a marriage seminars. Can you see what happens, right? In that in the, we, we think, oh, gosh, look at us. We, we, we're, we, we're not as strong marriage as that couple on Instagram. We're not, we're not as talented. Everyone reminds me who's leaving the church how untalented I am. And it's all got arrows on it to disturb the work of God deep down in the caverns of your heart. God, the devil wants you to stop work. He wants you to stop unearthing the original natural talent and giftings God placed in your life that were evident when you were eight years of age. And God wants construction to stop by you picking up a victim mentality. What can God do through somebody like me? And the answer is everything. Elijah was an ordinary person, just like you and me, and yet he claimed, that he, he said there'll be no rain for three years. There wasn't. Then there was rain because he declared there was rain. He's just like you and me. There are no extraordinary people on the earth today. Only faith people who allow their confidence to rule and reign their lives. You're, it's not what you believe that counts often. It's what you think about what you believe that counts. And I'm just, I'm just here to, uh, this session I've dedicated to rescuing you so you can feel really good about yourself and not feel like you're half of what you ought to be because of the critics, because of the liars, because of Satan trying to stop the work of God in you and the building of the temple within your heart. He's, he's organized opposition. He's organized the Tobias. He's organized that whoever else was coming against Ezra and coming against Nehemiah. And I would say that, that we need to stand up and realize, talk to the hand because the face ain't listening anymore. And there's five reasons uh, why I think um, you've got nothing to do with the difficult times that have happened in your church, nothing to do with the losses, nothing to do with the grievances. And the first one is because God sifts people. Oh my goodness me, this is God. I remember Al Fury prophesying over me 30 years ago. And, uh, and he's, he's, he just walked past me, he said, crushed, crushed olives. That's it, just crossed dollars. But I knew exactly what he meant, right? Because I was being, I was being sifted by God. I was, I was being crushed by God. But how do you know what's, what's inside of you? Unless there's a sifting, unless there's a crushing. And I realized the only way the anointing was going to ever saturate my life was through a crushing experience. And God allows churches to be sifted from season to season and from time to time. And what COVID proved, it proved there was five wise virgins and there was five really dumb virgins. But it doesn't prove that you're a bad teacher. It doesn't prove that you're a bad leader. It just proves they're bad listeners. I mean, let's, because all past that thing, oh, what I would have done, I would have done this better before COVID arrived. I would have done this. With, you wouldn't have done it better because you were doing well beforehand. It's just that at times God tests, he puts the church through a massive examination. And COVID was that examination. And some proved, the five virgins proved to have oil, and they've done really well. Some have proved not to have oil, and they've done really, really badly. Now, it's not the end of the road for them. They can jump on board, and they can get some more oil from the Holy Spirit and be better prepared next time. But can you see, can you see what God's done? This is not an examination of the leadership. This is an examination of the congregation of the leadership. Oh, man, I'm preaching so well. You... You, because, because, because we've got this humility that's overly humble. 
It's to, the, it's to the point not of submission, but subservience. That we become subservient, we become a slave to the master, and the master becomes the congregation. Oh, you need to get your mojo back. You need to realize that every now and again, God sifts the church. It's going to happen again 12 years time. I'm not a prophet, I'm making it up. And then it's going to happen in 20 years time. It's going to happen in 26 years time. It's the Lord's business that. Because he doesn't want people to slip into hell without realizing how far they are from heaven. And so God gives them a reality check, a wake-up call. And it's not a wake-up call for pastors. They preach faithfully. It's a wake-up call for the congregation. Number two, God strips things back. Uh, some congregations, if, you, if you're a church that's a brand new church, often, and I won't make this a rule, there's a seven-year itch. It happens in marriage, seven-year itch. It's, it's a common expression, seven-year itch, right? So there must be some truth to it. But generally it happens in church congregations as well. You know, year number one, everybody's super excited. Everybody's super inspired. Year number two, not just inspired, but now I'm motivated, right? Uh, year number three, join a team. Year number four, become a leader of a team. Year number five, I'm slightly discontented with the way this thing's been led. <laughs> number six, become as contentious as ever and sit in the back row of church. Year number seven, absenteeism, AWOL. They've disappeared and they're never coming back. Well, that's, that's I'll tell you what, why that is. It's because the people that come in in the first section of church life or the first when you have a new move of the Spirit of God feel like they're the special ones. And they are quite special. They get a visit from pastors, sometimes dinner out with the pastor, right? But the moment the maternity ward clicks in, the spotlight moves off them onto the maternity ward, so it should do, because these are new people who are newly getting saved or coming back to Jesus Christ. And then these original people think, what about us? And that causes a discontent because they've got ego issues. They've got problems of personal insecurity. They can't live well outside of the spotlight of God. But it's a testing from God, saying you're going to have to do well because you're actually in my spotlight. You think the spotlight's on those scoring goals, my spotlight's at those on the bench and those who are in the darkened corridors of church because, because God loves places that receive less natural honor. And so God makes up for it. So he just wants to increase people's relationship with God. And so God allows the seven-year itch to come along so you can just have a bit of a scratch then go in for another seven years. I'll just, I'll just make this up slightly, right? But there's some truth to it that there's four seven-year cycles in church life. The first seven-year cycle is experimentation. Uh, we, we're allowed to ride our bike anywhere and fail. We can come back with bloodied kneecaps. We can come back with scrapes all over our face. This is the experimental stage in church life. The second seven years is a systematic stage in, in, or the cultural stage in church life where you develop systems, you develop culture. You say, this is what we believe. This is what our values are. This is where we're going. It's, it's where you outline, this is, this is the nature of this church. And then the third seven years is the industrial stage where you work like dogs and, and where you create so much in, this, in the third seven years. The fourth seven years is where you operate um, and bring everything into smooth operational flow. It's a settling stage in church life. At the end of 20 years, often that's rebuilt. And sometimes we think, oh, something wrong with the church, it's in rebuilt. No, 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 you've been working hard for 28 years. Sometimes you just need to rebuild it. If you, you bought an old car that's 28 years old, you, you just might have to not just take the panels off. You, you might have to readjust some stuff in the engine. And I think somewhere along the line, the devil said, oh, it's because you're a rotten leader. No, 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 no. It's got nothing to do with me. It's got to do with a 28-year-old car here. You know, we're, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to rebuild things here, and that's the reason why God's stripped everything back. If you if you aren't making notes, you can do this really really quickly, right? The, the, every time every time you've got a team, God strips it back, right? So you always start with a borrowed team, somebody else's team, right? Because you think, oh, we're really going strong here. I've got a great children's church team. I've got a great church team from the old leader, right? But they don't last very long. God strips them back till you've got. Let me think, no team. <laughs> so it's just you. Well, why is that? Because one will put a thousand to flight. Forget about what two does. It's because on your neck will hang the shield of a thousand warriors. You don't need a team. 
oh my goodness. You, you, a half person who marries a half person doesn't make a whole person. When one person is putting a thousand of flight and they meet somebody else putting a thousand of flight, guess what happens when they get together? They put 10,000 of flight. It's amazing what one person can do. One person linked with one God is an extraordinary combination. But I'm talking about stripping back. And then you get a, a scaffold team, Scarlet Pimpernels, you don't know who they are, and they, they join the team, right? Now, God's going to strip that back because you don't know the motives of the people that have joined the team. That's why you should say to the person on the sound desk, could you help out on the sound desk till Easter? Till Easter. Easter. Keep saying Easter. Uh, can, then, then can you help out with stewarding until Christmas? Christmas. Christmas. That's when it ends. Christmas. Uh, can you be one of the backing singers uh, until Mother's Day? Mother's Day. And then, because if you don't put a deadline on it, then you, to extract somebody who's the wrong person in the wrong place is going to flick their rejection switch. And you don't want to do that. If you do, it's the end of the relationship with them. Sometimes you have to do it because you put the person in place that should never have been permanently put in place. People have to be faithful over projects before they're faithful over people. That's why Jesus made Judas the treasurer because it was the least important out of all the ministries in the church. And all the treasurer said. And <laughs> because, because, because God says, if you're faithful with things, then I'll, I'll make you faithful with people. But sometimes our mistake is we, we make people over people before we, they proved over things. Do you get it? It's just good teaching that, right? But so, so eventually the, the team dissipates and, and you're left uh, from scaffolding with some living stones. And they become the foundational team. And uh, the problem with foundational team, the good thing is it's happy families. The problem is that the person leading the singing can't really sing. The person in children's church hates kids, right? But, but they're faithful, right? And then you have to reorganize them in order to get a dream team. Once you've got a dream team, it does deplete over the years. Because once you've got a dream team, how do you send people off to do new locations? Where do you grab them from? Connect group leaders? I wouldn't think so. You grab them from your dream team. You send your dream team out. So, so there's, there's forever a depletion in all the stages of team life in church. It's not just aggregation. Oh my goodness, we need to get out of this primary school mentality of growth. Everything healthy grows. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It grows, then it depletes. It's just the seasonal wisdom of the Holy Spirit and of God. Uh, number three, uh, God, uh, ch God changes the seasons. Uh, this is amazing. The people who you did life with from A to B are rarely the people you do life with from B to C. God removes the first to establish the second. Hebrews 10 verse 9, in relation to God takes away the law to establish uh, the ministry of grace. But God takes away stuff to make room for the new stuff. And I'll tell you why uh, at times. This is for a new Christian, right? The person who took you from drowning in the middle of the lake to the edge of the lake is, is rarely the same person that takes you from the edge of the lake to the top of the mountain. It's because, they, because the person who rescued you from drowning still sees you as a bit of a loser, I mean, they still think, oh, you know, I, I still see as a heroin addict. You know, I'm, I'm trying to protect you. But they're not. They're fully, they're fully healed. And if not fully healed, the rest of their healing will come in action. It'll, it'll come as they're climbing the mountain. But that's why children often leave home when they're 18 or 23, because you still see them as 13. The problem's not their problem. They'd stay home longer if you stopped treating them like a child. But it's impossible to stop treating them like a child. Because it's just the way it is. And so, and so often, often the people now take you from the edge of the lake to the top of the mountain. They already see you as victorious. They're not interested in your story. Even if they hear your story, they don't quite believe your story. Because they wiped the past away. They've given you a fresh canvas to draw the next you on. And, and that's why... You know, you, that's why there's junctions where you say goodbye to friends and you think, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why we're parting right now. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's a God-arranged thing. Because they helped you for a stage of the journey. I, I, who wrote that song, Friends of Friends Forever? It's just a rubbish song. <laughs> because it's absolutely not true. Friends are friends for seasons. I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to re-sing it. David W. Smith. <laughs> friends are friends for seasons. Num number four, because um, God slows the church down. I don't know, we get junkies in church, that adrenaline junkies in church. Like they love it. 
They love it when the church grows. They loved it. They loved it when this church was on, on speed. You know, 2022, they're on speed. Oh, they love it because they used to be on heroin. Now they're on the speed of the church. It was fabulous in 22. Yeah, yeah, but it's still abnormal. It's still not natural. What natural is is line upon line. It's layer upon layer. That's what natural is. And so God at times slows the church down. He says, I'll see whether you love it for its speed or you love it for its saviour. I'll see whether you love it because of faith or you love it because of the furiousness of what you've seen in this place. God wants to mature his church. Sometimes he actually, sometimes he slows the church down to zero, sometimes negative. Because it's just God testing out, why do you love this place? And everyone loves a fast-moving machine. If you get a mega church in New Zealand, the reason why half of the people are in the mega church is because it's a mega church. They're not in the engine room. They've never had the revelation. They're following along in the dynamic and the momentum of the main carriages and the engine room. But straight when God slows the whole thing down, even, even comes to a crashing halt, it's amazing how many people get off board at a time like that. And it's the same in your church. Sometimes God slows it down, sometimes God speeds it up, but he won't just speed it up forever. There's a sell-by date on speed up because people get hooked on growth and hooked on the speed and the fury of a church that's going places. Every church is going places. And my suggest when we say what we need is a move of God, God's never stopped moving. <laughs> you know, this person came to me in Leeds when we started a, a, a location in Leeds. He said, when's revival going to start in Leeds? And I did jazz hands and I said, you're looking at it. Well, they never came back again because I just arrived in Leeds. The same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in me. They've got this false concept that God's doing nothing, twiddling his thumbs, until God moves. God is always moving. It was Barnabas who got behind a move of the Spirit of God by selling a block of land. That's an unpopular move of God. People just want to be filled with the Spirit, not filled with sacrifice. But there's a lot of things that are moves of God that, that we narrow a move of God down to something incredibly narrow. You can't actually build a healthy church on it. Preaching so well. Number five, God activates, wait for this one, the Gideon principle. Well, what is the Gideon principle? The Gideon principle is, oh, I think you've got too many people. I don't think your confidence is in numbers. So what does God do? He dismisses a whole lot of people, and then that's not even reduced down enough. You know, he's left with a few thousand people, and he reduces it down again. I think he's left with 300 people, right? 300 people against a Midian army of like 60,000 people, right? It's, it's ridiculous. Well, God needs to get you in a ridiculous situation. That's why I say this is not devastation. This is a stitch up. Currently, whatever you're in right now is a stitch up from the Spirit of God. There's impossibilities because God doesn't want you to become the Savior. There's only things that only God can do. There's a reduction so that it becomes more dramatic. How do you paint a great painting? Darken the background. And then splash some fluorescent colors in the foreground, you've got yourself a great painting. And that's what God's doing in many of our lives. It's the Gideon principle. It doesn't mean you're going to lose. It means that when you do win, you're going to give so much glory to God. It's going to cause an inner revival in every heart that was a part of that battle. Can you say amen? Now, if it's a normal congregation, I'd say, hey, let's clap God, right? But because you're leaders, we should never do that. We should be very silent, very still, and not like how we want the congregation to be. So, but when Craig said, when everyone come to the middle, all you guys from Christchurch thought we're not going to move. We, we're not moving. We're just going to stay exactly here. We're not going to do what pastor tells us to do. And they wonder why this Sunday, that's could everyone move to the middle. Nobody moves. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on a mission to make you feel better. I'm on a mission to make you feel fabulous. That's what I'm on a mission about. 
So you don't become overly conscious about everything you're not good at. Overly conscious about your disabilities, about your disadvantages. I've never, I've never seen a Hungarian crying beside the 100 meter track at any Olympic Games. Because Hungarians don't enter the 100 meters. It's not for them. Weightlifting. Oh, they're all there. At the weightlifting. And I think Satan's curse upon our lives is to make us think we ought to be 100 meter runners. And yet God's called you to weightlifting. It's, it was Einstein who said, don't teach, don't teach a, a fish to climb trees. It's just going to grow up thinking it's stupid. And I think that the people who leave your church and go out the door of your church say, hey, you're not a tree climber. That's right. You're right. But we end up trying to defend ourselves, then we feel defeated, and then we do a course on tree climbing. You know, then we humble ourselves, say, sorry, God, I can't tree climb. Well, what, what is that? It's satanic. That's what that is. You are the right person in the right place at the right time with the right disadvantages and the right advantages, with the right disabilities for God to anoint and the right abilities that God's already anointed. You, you are per perfect for such a time as this. I, I just, I'm speaking to culture here. Some of you think, well, who is this guy? What planet's he from? Well, I'm, I'm from Planet Hope. <laughs> There's only three things going to live forever. Faith, love, and hope. That, there's only three things. I'm manifesting one of them. So you might think, oh, are you too hopeful? No, no, I'm not hopeful enough. But what I want you to do is, is and I, I'm gonna, I, it's an odd thing I'm going to do at the end of this, but, but I, want you, I, want you to, I want you to do what Isaiah says in Isaiah 43, verse 18 to 20. You know it, right? It says, hey, forget the former things. It says, don't, don't dwell upon the past. So don't, don't, don't allow the tentacles of the octopus of the condemnation of the past to, to sting you or to pull you back any longer. So I'm doing a new thing. Well, often we can't see it unless we say goodbye to the old thing. We can't see the new thing. Now it's springing up. It's true in every one of our congregations. Craig outlined it, what's happening in the schools. It's springing up now. In every one of your lives, there's a staff there. There's, there's, a smooth, there's five smooth stones there. There's things in the picture. There's a ram in the thicket. There's things that you haven't seen, but they are there because they're springing up. It says, don't you perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert. I'm making streams. I'm making streams in the wasteland. <sighs> Madison, come back on, on the keys. Now, if you're a preacher, it's hard to know when to pull up, right? But I, I'm going to pull up. I'm just going to, I'm just going to just have a look and just see whether I'm going to say anything else about what we're talking about because I've got a feeling I'm not going to do it. What I'm going to do is there's a song that was written by James Blunt. Now, you might not know who James Blunt is, right? But he did a song three years ago that it was a quite a big song in the United Kingdom, but then it just kind of faded away until American Idol. And when American Idol came along three weeks ago, a Hawaiian boy who's 18 years of age, who goes by the name of I Am Tongi, he sang with James Blunt the song that I'm about to play to you, right? And this is a song about him saying goodbye to his father. It's, it's a beautiful song. And I'm not, I'm not trying to emotionalize the situation here, right? But what I'm going to do is, is straight after this song, the musicians and singers are going to sing the last song that we did. And I'm going to get you to come and we're going to have a bit of a burial service. The thing about ministry is there's dead bodies everywhere. You're walking over dead bodies. It's because we, we, things, things die easily in church life, but we don't bury them. And if you know anything about Genesis 23, when Sarah died at, I don't know, 173 years of age, whatever, that 
it says that it says six times that Abraham was, he 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 wanted her not just he wanted her to be buried. And I think for some of us, this this thing, this this body, the smell is 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 a bad smell, and it stops you breathing the oxygen of the heights and the highlands of the kingdom of God because because you haven't buried it yet. I think burials are, are fabulous because it's ashes to ashes. It's dust to dust, and into their into their hands, into your hands, Lord, we commit this bit. And this, it's a, I couldn't understand these lyrics, right? We'll 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 put it up on the screen in a second. The actual video, and it starts off before they turn out the lights. I want to read. I won't read you your rights and your wrongs. He says. This is a bigger thing than just getting back at people or not getting back at people. This is what's about to happen is the evidence of forgiveness, not just forgiveness. Forgiveness is a continual process. I, I realize that you've got to do it every single day. But burial is not a continual process. Burial is something that you do. And so in the song, he says, hey, this is a little higher than, than, than just the stuff we've both done wrong. And this is a little bit more, it's, it's, we're drawing this to a conclusion. And his dad, James Blunt's dad was about to die, had fourth uh, stage cancer in his liver. So halfway through the video, dad, his dad appears. Right? And then the chorus comes along, he says, I'm, I'm not your son, you're not my father, we're just two grown men saying goodbye. In other words, it's not an obligation. So oh, I've got to do this because I'm your son and I have to now take control of the situation. He said, no, this is two grown men. We're objectifying this. It's two grown men saying goodbye. And I just think that if you could say goodbye to the treacherous nature of your past, if you could say goodbye to the two-faced nature of your past, to the evildoers who have tried to ruin you and tried to take away your pizzazz, tried to, tried to make you a metronome of religious activity, tried to steal the joy of your spirit. You could, get, you could get your mojo back again today. I'm a man on a mission. God's, God told me to refresh these people in entirety. We've done a few things wrong, but have, hasn't everyone in the history of mankind but all the things that you've been accused of doing wrong, you haven't done wrong. And we're going to move away from the carcass of dragging ourselves through the cesspit of other people's critical spirits. And we're going to find ourselves on the other side of the Jordan River, receiving encouragement for God, knowing that we've been reserved by God for another time, knowing there's victory in our spirits, and we're going to preach and speak like we've been born again again. Let's watch this and then, then, then we'll get you to play after this video. Just start playing and then I'm going to call you down, those who need a funeral. Good night, Chloe. 
I guess we, we can extend this to people and things that have been close to us that have allowed us to look back and not just allow us to look forward in faith, but they've made us almost keep us in the realm of sadness and a realm of missing and a realm of reminiscing. In a good way, we could include in this altar call as well. I love what he says, that it's my turn now to drive the monsters away. It's our turn to get back into everything that Craig was saying, to get back into center stage, to get back into leading a generation, to get back into bringing everything to the party, both feet in the center of the will of God for the greatest season we've ever seen in the history of the church within this nation. Everybody stand up right now. I'm just going to mention this, my wife's book called Prophesy, it's 84 fire starters for a new devotional walk with God. You'd be wise to get that book. Here's my book called The Hit Factory with the expression that the next you is the next big thing. It's a fabulous book that. Here's my book called The Truth Diet and it's 181 nuggets of truth against a woke generation. It's my book called Think Twice. It's uh, 50 times 10 trains of thought, 500 trains of thought on how to live the Christian life well. If you think you can or if you think you can't, Henry Ford said you're both right. It's, it's a book about changing the way you think. And this is my book called Sacred Cows Make Great Barbecues. And I'll be barbecuing a few this morning and or this afternoon. And I've also got, I've drawn a map of the Christian mind that is an A1 map. And I'll talk about it later on, maybe tomorrow. But it's a, it's a fabulous visual aid. If you're like me, I'm a visual learner. It's a visual aid on how to renew your mind so that you can be transformed and so you can be changed from you into the next you. And this is a great visual aid for it. Lift your hands to heaven right now. Father, I pray that this will be a significant occasion. Father, there's some of us, Lord God, have still got the wounds of a brother. Some of us have got the depression that was brought on by the wounds of a brother. Some of us can still hear the words that have broken our heart, words of hatred and words of confusion and words of spite. Some of us still have a dagger dug deep within our back. And I pray, God, in the next few minutes that there will be healing there'd be removal of arrows, there'd be a removal of condemnation, a removal of hurt. I pray, God, you'd mix it with forgiveness and mix it with forgetfulness, but I pray that you'd come, God, and that we'd have a funeral and into your hands we'd commit our past, both weird and wonderful. Father, we declare that Moses is dead and we declare that the Joshua generation is rising. And I pray, God, that out of this funeral will come 
mighty acts of the Spirit of God, performed by people who are born again again, who have found the freshness of faith and the freshness of joy, no longer bound by the accusations of others. And so let power hit this altar in Jesus' mighty name. As we sing the last song that we sung, I want you, I'm going to give you, not too long, I'm going to give you maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds, just so that we don't elongate the process. So we make it more decisive, not just emotional. But I'm going to open this altar call up and I'm going to give you 10 seconds to come out here so that we can pray a prayer together and we can see deliverance and we can see a whole new horizon open up before you in Jesus' mighty name. Let's do it now. Come on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. That's what we're doing right now. We're making room for God. Come on down. Come a little closer. Yeah. Joseph gave birth to Manasseh, which means to forget, and to Ephraim, which means fruitful in the land of my suffering. Father, I pray that we'd not just have a funeral, but we'd give birth to two children to the child of forgetfulness, to the child of fruitfulness, Lord God. Let this be a crossing over in Jesus' name. We say goodbye to the past. We wave goodbye to the voices of the past, the echoes of the past, the injuries of the past, the abandonment of the past, the depression of the past, the arrows of the past. Come on, sing this with us. Come on, it's words of faith. Come on. Come on, we're dedicating ourselves. Your way is better. Your way is better, Lord. Come on, let's declare it. Your way is better. Your way is better. say this after me, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We allow the living to die. We let go of the past. Say it after me, we let go of the past. We declare that Moses is dead. The good times and the hard times of the past are gone. I commit everything into your hands. Every word spoken into your hands. Every arrow shot into your hands. I forgive those who hurt. 
for they know not what they did. I release them into your hands. I forgive the treacherous. I forgive the captors of the enemy. I place them in your hands. The Lord, let a line be driven. Say it after me, let a line be driven. In the sand below me, between the past and the future. Today I cross over into my Canaan, into my future. I feel inadequate, but I know that you're my sufficiency. I feel lost, but I know that you're my compass. I feel alone, but I know that you're with me. Lord, this is how it started when I got saved. And today, let it be how I begin again. Restore my confidence and restore my strength. Take away condemnation. Take away guilt. And today I want to thank you that I stand as the right person in the right place at the right time with the right abilities, the right advantages, with the right disabilities and the right disadvantages. I thank you, Lord. I'm ready to go all the way with you. Keep your hands lifted. I can sense it right now. There's strength. There's strength. There's strength. It's entering in. Just If you're with your partner, just hold hands with them right now. It won't take me long, but I'm just going to... That's it. Strength. That's it. That's it. That's, that's it. Oh, my goodness me. My goodness me. My goodness me. Every hour out in Jesus' name. Every hour out. Out in Jesus' name. Oh, you were born for the heights, for the highlands. You're going to start to smell the clarity of the fresh mountain air of God. God's going to take you out of the weeds and out of the, of the toxic valleys in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. He's setting you free today, setting you free today. He's setting you free today. The whole axis of your life's going to change as of today in Jesus' mighty name. Father God, Father God, we let go. We let go of everything and every everything, every issue of justice we let go of in Jesus' name. And Father God, strengthen these hands and strengthen these knees and legs in Jesus' mighty name. Mm, see, you, you don't need to be mighty because you're mighty in God. It's not physical strength. It's not mental capacity. God loves frail and fragile because all the glory goes to him. All the glory goes to him. You've had to be overly brave. And I congratulate you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You've been driven, 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 driven. Pushed, 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 pushed. And you're going to have a nice spirit. And you're going to be pleasant to people, but you're not going to be driven anymore. You're going to move according to the rhythm of grace talked about in Matthew 11. Oh, there's going to come a new anointing. I can feel it now, a new anointing upon you. Sometimes it's taken about a thousand wax to break the rock, but I can see just one whack. You'll, you'll do it in the right place. You won't attempt to try and just do it with the zeal of the Lord. You'll do it with wisdom. You'll do it with wisdom. You, your teeth are returning. Your cutting edge is returning. Uh, your, your, your strength is going to be in your bite, and your bite is going to be a fantastic bite. And cut ch chunks out of things. You're going to chew things, and it's just going to be so effective in Jesus' name. He's sharpening your cutting edge again in Jesus' mighty name. Are you together? Oh, yeah. Big man. 
<laughs> oh my God. Lord, they're here to bring sunshine to a generation. Father, we, we rebuke the clouds. Father, the clouds of uh, oppression, the cloud of depression, Lord God. And Father, we speak, God, to the mind and we clear it of all kinds of cumulus nimbus and cirrus clouds and dark clouds. In Jesus' name, Father God. Father, we thank you, God. And Father God, we thank you that nothing will stop them from planting. Nothing will stop them. Don't, don't wait for a clear day. And nothing's going to stop you from planting. Now's the, now's the right time. You've had ideas. You've had thoughts and ideas. You know, when are we going to do that? When, when somebody said, hey, when the wind stops howling. We're gonna do, well, as you start to plant, the, the, the wind will stop howling. It's, it's just there to stop you from stepping out in faith. And as you step out, the sun's going to appear. The sun's going to appear. It's going to appear in Jesus' name. Uh, Father, for this, wow, what a couple, God. What a couple, God. What a couple, Jesus. What a couple, God. Lord, what a couple, God. What a couple. You, you know, you've got limited energy, and it, God does top up our energy banks, but there's nothing better than wisdom. There's nothing better than strategy. I can see a game of chess going on here, and I can see, I can see that there's a mastermind within you. Some people have said, well, what, why would you move that piece? But you, you, you are people who think two or three steps ahead. There's wisdom in it. There's strength in it. And Father, right now, God, let the strategizer return. And Father, let the confused and the complex thoughts be dismelled in, in Jesus' name. Father God, yeah, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. No more tears, no more tears, no more tears, no more tears, no more tears. Father, who can mend a broken heart but you, God? And Lord, they've experienced a, a lot of loss, God, and even from relatives and from parents and people around about them, Lord God. But Father, there's still a road to travel. And God would say it's a road less traveled. It's a road of faith. It's not a repeat. It's not just going around the same old mountain. There's exciting. There's new terrain. There's new adventures that God has in place for you. And God will open up both natural adventures and he'll open up spiritual adventures. And you'll find that it wasn't the end. And you're not playing on extended time. But destiny is about to be unfolded in Jesus' name. And Father, this wonderful couple, Lord God, this lady, oh, just put on the right jacket today, God. Oh, Father, we thank you, God. And I declare that nothing can stop you. There's nothing that can stop you. There's nothing. And I declare again that all things are working for good. They're working for good. Father, fill them with an optimism that is unusual. And when they speak, Lord God, let people's chains be released. God. Let them be deliverers of a generation in Jesus' name. You know your words will not return void. They'll accomplish for that which they've sent. And was it Samuel that not one word dropped, not one word was wasted. And God would say that about you, that, that what you say, not one word will be wasted. You're about to move into a, a huge arena of fruitfulness. But it's come from today, this funeral of forgetfulness, Jesus' name. And Father, this man of God, Lord, release him. Lift your hands to heaven. Father, release him, Lord God. Father, quicken his steps, God. And we declare the steps of a good man are ordered by God. Ordered by God. Ordered by God. Give him wisdom. Give him clarity, Lord God. And let him run by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of his God. In Jesus' name. And Father God, oh God, on the edges but not on the edge. On the edges but not on the edge forgotten about by people but not forgotten about by you and father i thank you look god reserved Res i'll say it again what i preached you, you've got to reserve you've been reserved for something magnificent in god don't despair don't despair what's coming is beyond your expectations it's beyond uh what you could actually dream of it's just the way god works and so god would say don't despair but be expectant and, and don't allow people to dampen the joy and dampen the expectancy in jesus name father i want to thank you god that you're a blesser 
and you free us from pain like Jabez. So you extend and enlarge our territory like Jabez. And you bless us like Jabez. Father, bless her in every way in Jesus' name. And Father, we, this beautiful quadruple family of God, come on, lift your hands to heaven. Father God, Lord, let your anointing, that's it, that's it, that's it. Oh, what a, oh, my goodness me. My goodness me. Father, you make hard things easy. You make hard things easy, God. Father God, Father God, your yoke is easy, your burden is light, Jesus. Father, they've been driven by need. They've been driven by expectation. They've been driven uh, by the thoughts of other people. But Father God, take away the driving nature in Jesus' name. Let them only do what they see the Heavenly Father doing, God. Let that be the secret of their success and the secret of their ministry, God. With a thousand needs, with a thousand people, God. Father, let them simply be led by the power of the Spirit of God. Father, let, it, let them do it all, not just with a, a seventh-day Sabbath, but let them also do it in the Sabbath. That it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the Spirit of God. Father, let them be motivated by good. Let every good idea be banished. Let every God idea raise up in Jesus' name. Father God, let them know the difference between the good and the God. And Father God, I pray that you'd give them holidays and holy days, God. Holidays and holy days. That's what God wants to give to you, you know. Holidays. You need a holiday. <laughs> That's what you need is a holiday. Oh, Father. Sometimes people have said, go on, why don't you go on holidays? Just because no one's giving me any money to go on holidays. And so if you see this lady afterwards, make sure you give her some money, right? Because <laughs> that's the only thing holding her back from a Caribbean cruise. In Jesus' name is the money. And Father, bless them, God. Let, let joy be their signature, even in the most uh, terminal of cases, God. Let them brighten up every hospital. Let them brighten up every food line. In Jesus' name. And Father God, we... Lift your hands toward this fabulous couple now. And Father God, every arrow out. Someone stand behind them right now. Every arrow out. Every arrow out. Every arrow out. Every lie out. Every permutation, every connotation out in Jesus' name. Every voice that echoes out in Jesus' name. Father, every worry out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, every what if out in Jesus' name. Every doubt out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord God, she started off as a woman just with a simple faith. And Father, let her, that be her calling card, Lord, to tomorrow. A woman with a simple faith. An ordinary woman with a simple faith who sees an extraordinary God do extraordinary things in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I want to thank you, Lord God, that she's perfect. That she's absolutely perfect, God. I thank you, Jesus, for her obedience in, in not saying the things that she's always wanted to say. I want to thank you for her obedience in not applying justice to situations that have required uh, ab absence, God. For, Lord, holding back for the control over this woman. But I pray, God, that even right now, Jesus, I can see God taking an ocean and God making a river. And I can see that the river that God's making out of your life will be like the Congo, like the Amazon, like the Nile. That God is not making a small river just to move small mountains. He's making a large, unstoppable river to move large mountains. And it'll be by the power and momentum of the river. I can see, like people reveal a brand new car on the market, that cloth coming off. I can see a cloth coming up and people being amazed, thinking, where, where, has, what, where did that come from? And it's because God made a river of power while others were looking in other directions. And Father, for this man of God in Jesus' name, Father God, he's had to take the fights uh, of a movement and the fights of his church and the fight for his family, God. Father, this guy's had to have uh, daggers and swords, uh, pistols, uh, shotguns, rifles, God. Father God, and Father, I thank you that from now on the battle belongs to God. Father, we declare that's enough. And Father, we declare that you're putting up a, a mist behind him. And we thank you, God, that every pharaoh is going to drown into the sea. 
and rise no more. We declare the enemy shall rise no more. That enemy who that's risen its ugly head again and again, that's the end of that enemy in Jesus' mighty name. Moses, arise and take these people into the promised land. Have a look at the land, at the promised land, and take these people into the land of Canaan, God says, in Jesus' mighty name. Stop looking back. The enemy's completely defeated. It's a brand, absolutely brand new day. Fear not, God says. There's so much that you're going to conquer. There's so much territory that God has already marked out for you in Jesus' name. Father, quicken the speed and quicken the strength, God, and we thank you, Jesus, as you quicken the outcome in Jesus' name. I declare great things. Expect great things from God and see great things from God in Jesus' name. Let's, let's just sing the chorus of that song one more time in this session. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. We're making room. We forgive and we forget. We put the past behind us. Press on. Streams in the wasteland. Streams in the wasteland. Rivers in the wasteland, rivers in the wasteland, rivers in the wasteland. Shut up, ba 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 Roads and deserts, the roads and deserts. They said it couldn't be done until Cray came along and did it. Roads and deserts. You're going to become a man of the impossible. You're going to become a man of possibility. This place is going to be known as the Miracle Center. It's going to be known as the place where miracles happen. It's, you're going to be the voice where people expect things to change. A new authority coming on in Jesus' name. Father, come on. We're going to make room for you. Come on. Sing it twice more. Last time, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Father God, we make room for you within our minds, within our bodies, within our spirits, God. Father, virgin territory that's going to be built out by cities of goodness and cities of joy and cities and metropolises of love. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for dispelling the fear of failure, dispelling the fear of opposition, dispelling negativity and dispelling doubt. We thank you, God, that through this funeral, we thank you, God, that we've been committed our past into your hands. And we thank you, Jesus, for the hallmark of a brand new day. We thank you, God, that wherever our foot travels, you'll give to us. We thank you that the steps of a good man are ordered by God. And we thank you that even if it's a small step, it's a large step for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's give God a huge clap offering of praise. Come on.